This exploit allows me to execute commands over SSH without any credentials. In this video, we will develop an exploit for a vulnerable SSH server running inside Erlang. This is a highly concurrent programming language. It is used to build large scalable systems. Erlang is commonly used in telecommunications and internet provider services. Earlier this year, the SSH library is using hit a critical vulnerability that allows unauthenticated session to the server. Since this has been disclosed, there are already a lot of proof of concepts in GitHub. But I want to take this opportunity to learn in depth the protocol I've been using since I started my career. In order to understand the vulnerability, we need to dive a little bit on the protocol architecture. Secure Shell itself consists of three distinct protocols. First is the transport layer protocol. Next is the authentication protocol. And last is the connection protocol. Transport layer is responsible for choosing the protocol version, exchanging the encryption keys, and performing the encryption for the bottom two layers. Authentication layer is the phase where the client negotiates the authentication methods to the server. This is also the part where the host operating system will decide whether to allow the user to access the server or not. Once the client is authenticated, the connection layer will set up the necessary channels that the clients want. This can be a standard pseudo terminal session, an X11 forwarding, or just running a command remotely. The protocol specification states that these layers must be completed in order, but the vulnerability in Erlang bypass passes the authentication phase completely that allows attackers to execute remote commands without needing any credentials. Let's go to my terminal and see how the exploit will look like. I prepared the base structure already, but don't worry, I will explain the details. First will be the basic imports to handle command line parameters and low-level network connections to the target. This exploit contains only three arguments. First is the target IP. Next is the port. SSH running in Erlang by default runs on port 2222, so we will set the default value to that number. Last is the command that we want to execute on the target. In my testing, only blind remote command executions work against this vulnerability, so the best way is to trigger a reverse shell. Below that, we have our exploit class. There are a few methods for now, but we will add more later. We will initialize the class by accepting the argument so they will be instance attributes. These will be the target IP, port, and remote command. Then we will kick off the socket connection here. SSH protocol works under same TCP connection, so we will reuse this socket throughout the class methods. We have here the first two methods for exchanging the protocol banner and encryption keys. When connecting to an SSH server, you will encounter a message like this. This is the server telling you what version it is running. The first part is the SSH protocol version. So far, we only have version one and two. The next one is the software that implements the protocol. In this case, it is running OpenSSH, which is a popular implementation used by most operating systems. The next strings are comments, which can indicate anything. In this example, the comment shows the operating system version. There are carriage return and line feed characters at the end, which is a requirement from the protocol. We don't see it here right now, but we can see it when we inspect the packets. In order for the transaction to proceed, the server expects a similar set of string from the client. We can change the software version and comments to anything we want. For example, we can do something like this and server will accept it. Once server received that, it will show you the different encryption, compression, and hashing algorithm it supports. You then need to do same thing by sending him also the list of algorithms you support. But this time you cannot just type or paste anything here and expect it to work. This is where our exploit script will help us, so let's go back to the terminal. First, we need to start talking to the server by sending our own connection string. We will send this through the socket we initialized during start of the class instance. Then we will send a string using similar format we discussed a while ago, and we should not forget the terminators at the end. Finally, we need to encode it so the string will be converted to bytes object. After exchanging the banners with the server, the next part of the protocol is to have an agreement on what algorithm to use. The protocol specification defines this format of the key exchange initialization packet. The first part of the packet is the message code. Everything here, including this one, must be converted into bytes format before sending throughout the wire so we will handle it later on our code. The next will be a random 16 bytes data called the cookie. This is used to randomize both ends. Third will be the key exchange algorithm. This is the method on how to exchange the symmetric keys. The most common will be Diffie-Hellman and elliptic curves. The next will be the host key algorithm, which identifies the host system running the SSH server. This is the one you normally see when connecting to a new server or if the server got re-imaged. In order to accept the host keys, you add it under the known host file in your home directory. After that, we see the actual encryption algorithm, which will be used to encrypt packets. 
Typically, we use advanced encryption standards. Next set of algorithms are used for packet integrity. These are the hash functions used in order to make sure the packets are not tampered in transit. The last set of algorithms will be for compression. With extra bytes added to the packet due to encryption, it is important to compress them less than the bandwidth used during the process. After the algorithms, you will see some other fields like the language tags, which is used to tell each side in what language the information is being presented to each other. The guess packet is interesting. During this phase, both ends will guess what are the supported algorithms they can use. At any point, one can send a packet using an algorithm it thinks both ends can use. If this is set to true, then that means a guess packet will be sent afterwards. The last is a gray area. This is related to the vulnerability. We will discuss this in a bit, but for now, let's go back to the terminal and see how to construct most of this key exchange initialization packet. I made some few changes to slowly understand how this works. First is I added some imports. First is used to manipulate the bytes data. And the next will be just a helper module to be used like generating the random cookie. Under the key exchange init method, you see also I added a few lines. The first thing we need to do is to construct the message code. As per protocol specification, this is set to number 20, so we will use that and pack it to a one byte data in Big Indian format. Throughout the code, we will use Big Indian since that is the format recognized by most network protocols, including SSH. The next one is the cookie, which is just any random 16-byte data. This is also the reason why we imported the OS module, so we can easily generate something. After that, you see the list of key exchange algorithms. This is a comma-separated list of strings, which I just copied from an example packet. It is not shown in this part, but at the end, there is an encode function to convert this into a bytes object. The next part is to get the length of that entire data. This is not clearly defined in the protocol specification, but it is used so that the receiver will know where to start and stop reading data inside the packet. If you notice, I used a private function to get the length. In the protocol spec, almost everything is stored inside an unsigned 4-byte integer. To do that, we need to pack the length of the data into this format, which is, again, using Big Indian as we discussed a while ago. Next field of the packet will be the server host key algorithm. I followed same strategy, which is to copy the value from a sample packet and encode it into bytes object. Then I used same private method to get the length of the data and pack it into 4-byte unsigned integer. Next will be the encryption algorithm. I followed similar strategy, but there is something different here. If you notice, the variable name signifies the direction. That's because we also need to specify another one, but this time it will be the opposite direction. So in summary, we need client to server first, then server to client. We'll repeat same process for the MAC algorithm and compression algorithm. Technically, these values can be just the same, so I can write it like this. But I want to emphasize the actual structure of the packet as defined from the protocol specifications. Language tag follows similar strategy, but here we can just put a null value. Then the packet to follow field will be set to a null byte to tell the server that we will not send any guest packet. Last will be the reserved field. We will set this to zero. You notice that we also have a helper function here. This is another private method that will pack any number into four byte unsigned integer since that is the common format in the packet fields. Once we are done defining the fields, we will assemble the packet, then send it through the socket. The order of the fields is important and should follow the one specified in the protocol specifications. Only difference is that in the protocol spec, you will not see the field length, but we included it in our payload. I think that is a fundamental information you need if you want to be an exploit developer. There is one more thing we need to take into account before sending this packet. The protocol requires us to put a padding so that the packet size is always a multiple of the encryption block size. So I created a helper method here to do that. The helper private method contains few lines of code, but this is very important. It accepts a payload in bytes, which contains most of the packet fields. Then it returns the new packet with a padding included and some other information. We will set the reference block size as eight. Then the minimum length of padding is four. In order to calculate the amount of padding, we need to perform modulo operation against the length of the payload. For example, let's say our payload length is 243. Then the block size of the chosen cipher is eight. In order for the packet to be a multiple of eight, we need to add five. The result is 248, which is a multiple of the block size. So how can we compute for five? The technique is to perform modulo operation against the payload length, then subtract that from the block size. Now we have our padding length. If the length of the padding we got is less than the minimum padding, we will adjust it. Aside from the padding, we need also to include the new packet length. To do that, we need to total all the lengths we gathered. Then the final packet will consist of the total length, the payload, and the actual padding bytes, which we will set to null bytes. We are done on the first part of the exploit, which is to initiate the protocol version and perform the key exchange initialization. The last step will be to proceed directly in opening a channel and executing shell commands.
We have here two methods, one for opening the channel and another one for requesting the channel session. Opening a channel is the first step inside the connection protocol. The mechanics here is simpler and the packet contains less fields compared to the key exchange packet. During this phase, we allocate channel numbers, which is like ports in TCP. This part is also flow controlled, meaning both ends need to take into account the window size, which is the amount of data each ends can send at any given time. The first field of the packet is the message code, followed by channel type we want. In this exploit, we will use session as the channel type. Then we will indicate any random channel number we wish to use, followed by the window size, then the maximum packet size. After the channel is open, next step is to request for the channel session. We want to execute remote commands. The packet fields look similar. First is the message code, followed by the channel number. The string payload we will indicate is exec. We can either tell the server that we want to reply or not. During my testing, putting a null byte will still work because we don't really care about the output, but instead we care about the reverse connection. Last part will be the command we want to execute. Let's quickly go through the method for opening a channel. The first part is the message code, which is 98. Codes greater than 80 is reserved for the messages inside the connection layer. This is where the vulnerability happens. Since as per protocol specifications, the message code the server expects after the transport layer is within this range, the vulnerable library allowed any connection to use a message number higher than that which are messages found inside the connection layer. After the message code, we need to set the channel type, which is session. We also get the field length using same technique we did previously. Next to that is the channel number, which we can just set to zero. The window size can be anything. The maximum packet size is theoretically 1,500 bytes, but we can set it to something higher than that. Then finally, we assemble our packet with the required padding and send it through the socket. The last method will be for sending our actual command to the server. Message code is 98 since this is a channel request. Channel number will still be zero. Channel type will now be exec. Then we pass our actual command, which we can get from the script arguments. We assemble our packet, then send it through the channel. After our script is finished, we can run Erlang using the vulnerable SSH library. Then we can put any reverse shell command we want. And we should expect a callback. I hope you learned something today. If you find my content valuable, please support me by liking this video and subscribing to my channel. See you on the next one.